uh, chief residents. Um, so good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Um, Ali Garavi to our Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, Dr. Garavi is the J. Meltzer uh, Professor of Nephrology and Hypertension and serves as Chief of the Division of Nephrology Director of the Center for Precision and Genomics in the Department of Medicine and is the Interim Chair of the Department of Medicine at Columbia University. Uh, after receiving his medical degree from George Washington University, he completed residency in internal medicine and fellowships in hypertension and nephrology at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. He then completed a postdoctoral fellowship in human genetics at Yale University and joined Columbia in about 2003. Uh, Dr. Garavi's research is focused on the molecular genetics of kidney diseases, and his work has led to the discovery of genes and loci for IgA nephropathy and congenital defects of the kidney and urinary tract. His research has demonstrated the utility of clinical sequencing in the diagnosis and management of patients with kidney disease, and he is extending his work to other adult uh, constitutional disorders. His goal is to bring per personalized genomic medicine from the laboratory into patient care. He is the PI of multiple scientific projects funded by the NIH, including the All of Us Grant, the National Precision Medicine Initiative. He was elected to the American Society of Clinical Investigation and the American Association of Physicians. He is a recipient of the Judson Dayland Prize for Outstanding Clinical Investigation from the American Philosoph Philosophical Society, the National Medical Award from the Kidney and Urology Foundation of America, and the Homer Smith Award from the American Society of Nephrology. He also received the Mentor of the Year Award at Columbia University, a testament to his passion for teaching and sharing knowledge. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ali Garavi to our Medical Grand Rounds. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, doctors for knowing Sosa and Weiss for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor to present at the Cunha Richardson uh, lectureship uh, today. And I hope that uh, some of the talks, some of the things that I'm going to talk about today reflect some of the philosophy for uh, dedicate and dedication to patient care uh, as exemplified by uh, doctors Cunha and Richardson here. Um, I started as a clinician. Uh, who wind up doing research as a fellow and then wind up doing a lot, mostly spending most of my time at research, um, starting with, you know, looking at gen the genetic disease basis of some rare diseases, uh, and then realize that there's a lot of opportunity for actually implementing the genetic practice into, into, into clinical care. And so let me tell you the story that's going to be um, obviously focused uh, on kidney diseases, but I will hope to give you uh, these implications for clinical care across the wider breadth of uh, internal medicine practice. Uh, so these are my disclosures. I don't have any, uh, and there's nothing in my talk that's going to, uh, you know, that, uh, that's going to discuss any of these uh, interests. There's one study that we wind up doing with Natera that I wind up, uh, I will talk about very briefly. So um, I'm going to start with the patient-oriented questions. These are the set of questions that patients ask us when they see us in the clinic. They come to us because they have the problem and they want to know, you know, what is this disease that I have? Why do I have this disease? What will happen to me? And what are the treatment options that are available? In fact, these set of questions were suggested to us uh, when I was, we were designing a national study called CureGN for primary glomerular disorders. It was suggested by my colleague, Andy Baumbach, and he said, we should frame the study around these set of patient questions to make sure that we always remain anchored in patient questions, and we answer those questions that are most relevant in clinical practice. And I think this is, I'm going to try to frame this talk uh, around these questions as well as I talk about genetic uh, genomic medicine. Uh, a twist to all of this has come in the past decade as genomic technologies have been introduced into clinical care, and that is that patients can come to us with uh, you know, asking for genome sequencing, for the genome diagnostics, or may have had some form of genome sequencing already, and they want you to interpret this. And some version of this is going to be people coming with a hard disk with maybe with their genome sequence already and say, come to their primary doctor and say, please interpret this for me and let me know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of direct uh, to consumer testing that's available, such as Ancestry.com or 23andMe. I don't know how many of you have had any of this genomic uh, uh, testing done. Uh, some people have done it. And so 
that has some uh, medically relevant uh, information, but a lot of it is actually what we call recreational genomics. And so you have to be able to put this into context for your patients. And so as clinicians, as internists um, and subspecialists, we all have to be knowledgeable about uh, the use of genomics so at least know how, to, how and when to refer patients for appropriate workup. All of this has come about because the human genome sequence was sequenced. The first uh, was uh, the, the the first draft of the human genome uh, became available in 2001. That was a single genome uh, that's become the reference genome essentially. In fact, it was an amalgamation for of at least four different genomes. Uh, and we realized that the human genome has three billion nucleotides, and it took three billion dollars and ten years to get that first draft of the human genome. And so the real challenge then was to really sequence individual genomes, and it was too costly at the time. But about a decade ago, um, next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing became available. And so now we can sequence entire genomes in less than 24 hours for a few hundred dollars. And so the, now millions of people have had some form of genome sequencing done. The sequences have been placed in databases that are publicly available and searchable, not on the individual level, but on the aggregate, to determine what variants are common, what variants are rare in the population. And so the challenge for the clinical geneticists and for all the genomic researcher and in clinical practice now is to identify that one typo in the genome in those three, among these three billion nucleotides that result in disease. And so that's really what we need to do to be able to decipher what's disease causing, what's pathogenic versus a, a, a benign polymorphism that's prevalent in the population. And that work is still ongoing. And, and yet we've made a lot of progress in terms of incorporating and interpreting human genome data. So trying to take a sort of a broader view in terms of thinking about genetic determination of disease, I think you gotta think about gene, environment, demographics, all of these are factors that contribute to health and disease and can the aggregation of these factors can tip the balance towards health and disease. What I'm gonna mostly talk about are these situations where you have a single typo in the genome, which has a very large impact uh, on the development of disease and increases the probability of disease significantly so that, you know, across the lifetime, it's virtually, you know, uh, guaranteed that somebody is going to develop, manifest some aspect of that particular clinical condition. And these are typically the monogenic diseases. These are where you have a single gene that's uh, defective and there's a lot of them out there in the population. Most of these patients uh, who have these monogenic diseases cluster at the tail end of the distribution. You can think about patients who have severe familiar hypercholesterolemia, who have very early onset cancer, who have very early onset diabetes, for example, or you know, hypertension, coronary heart disease. These patients who are very young and have these extreme phenotypes tend to be enriched for uh, these monogenic kidney diseases. They are, tend to be enriched in tertiary care medical centers. And so we as academic clinicians will see a lot of such patients in our practices in the hospital and so forth. And of course, they, they're enriched in pediatric populations and young adults. So how common are these monogenic diseases? Well, there are at least 6,200 monogenic disorders that have been cataloged where, the, where, where we know what the molecular basis is. So this, and that list is growing every day. And this probably this number is already out, uh, out of date. It affects about you know, roughly 1% of the population. And it's estimated that about 5% of the population below the age of 50, uh, 25 will have a disease due to a genetic component. If you think about complex traits such as diabetes and hypertension, 60% 60, 60 of individuals have some sort of a genetic influence trait at some point in their life. And then all, now that we've sequenced lots and lots of people, millions of people, and we try to identify uh, variants in their genome that look, that, that might be pathogenic, as many as one in five individuals harbor variants in their genome that might be disease causing. And so the real challenge is to determine which one of these are gonna be really disease causing and lead to future risk of, you know, uh, of complications. So uh, this is you know, a one uh, you know, a database called OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man, which has a list of uh, monogenic disorders. And you can see how many phenotypes have been uh, you know, described and how many of them have a gene for which there's a, there's a, there's a, a you know, so the molecular basis is known, the genetic basis is known. So 6,200 uh, that have been cataloged, 4,400 for which the, the molecular basis is known. So some of the, what are some of the common, common modes of inheritance? We have, you know, dominant uh, inheritance. You can he, see here, um, 
on, on this side, uh, where you have a heterozygous phenotype, which results in disease, uh, and dominant disorders are transmitted from one generation to the next, 50% of offsprings are affected, uh, and there's an equal male to male and female distribution. Semi-dominant uh, disorders are the ones where the heterozygote has the phenotype that's intermediate between the homozygote and the wild type. Uh, and so you have some of these as well. I'm going to talk about some of them. Autosomal recessive uh, disorders are the ones where you need two copies of the mutation, so one inherited from each parent. Uh, and typically, parents are carriers. 25% uh, of kids are affected. Again, males and females are affected equally. And then you have the sex-linked disorders, the classic ones where you have the recessive disorders where uh, it's on the X chromosome. Uh, female, females are typically uh, uh, mildly affected or not affected at all. And it's really uh, you know, males that are affected and there's no male-to-male -male transmission. Uh, and you can have dominant forms of this or semi-dominant forms of this very often where again, females might be mildly affected and then pass it down to, uh, to other, uh, other women and uh, uh, males may, may be actually may be lethal for them. So, so what are some of the common disorders? I mentioned familial hypercholesterolemia, non-polyposis colon cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2 associated breast and ovarian cancer, polycystic kidney disease, and you can see the list. We're not going to go through all of them, but these are very co fairly common ones in the population, and particularly for the top four, you will encounter them in clinical practice. Uh, these are some of the common recessive disorders. Actually, deafness is very common. The genetic basis of deafness is actually very well known. There are literally 50 to 60 different monogenic forms of deafness that can affect the general population quite significantly, and including the older population. And so this is something to be, uh, to be aware of. Hemochromatosis, sickle cell disease, cystic fibrosis, these are some of the classics that we are all aware of. So when we try to identify these genomic, uh, these genetic diseases, um, now there is, we can do sequencing. And now we can sequence all 3 billion nucleotides in a genome that's available uh, and for, as a clinical test nowadays. Um, however, when we sequence those 3 billion nucleotides, what we really can best interpret are the coding portions of the genome. So these are the exons. Uh, these are the coding portions of the genes. And there are about 20,000 genes in the, in, in the genome. So you can start sequence the entire genome and just focus on those regions of the genome that are coding, or there's a way of selectively sequencing just those coding regions, and that's called exome sequencing, so that 1% of the genome. And so you can do exome sequencing. That's currently a sweet spot for sequencing in terms of cost and sort of uh, comprehensiveness. But when you think about these 20,000 genes in a genome, as I mentioned, there are 44 to 4,700 for which you know, for which there's a known disease association. So even if you sequence all the coding portions of all the genes in the genome, if you do a clinical sequencing, you're going to only look for those genes that have a known uh, disease association. And so there's a way of just selectively sequencing those 44, 4,500 genes and then that's called sometimes a medical exome or a mendelium. So you can order a genome, an exome, a medical exome, and then you can even refine this further because all of these genetic disorders, these genes that are associated with genetic disorders are not associated with a phenotype that is of interest to you. For example, if you're interested in cardiomyopathy or in kidney diseases, then you can even subselect a smaller panel of genes uh, that, for, that are targeted to specific disease categories, as I mentioned, cardiac disorders, kidney disorders, and so on and so forth. So now as clinicians, we have a lot of options. We can order panel tests, we can order medical exomes, we can order whole exomes and genomes. And a lot of it has to do with sort of how to best adapt the test to the clinical scenario. And of course, what will be reimbursed by insurance. And nowadays, in terms of cost benefit and reimbursability, these panel tests appear to be sort of the most, uh, the easiest to handle uh, and, uh, re and they're reimbursable. So now that I give you this background, let me go back now to you know kidney diseases and how we got our sort of uh, our entry into thinking about genetics for uh, kidney diseases. Uh, these are very common in the population. This is a study published in the Lancet. The global prevalence is about uh, 9.1 percent. Uh, chronic kidney disease, which is a reduction in uh, kidney function, that's estimated by your GFR. And the etiologies um, are the more com the most common etiologies are congenital cystic uh, disorders, 
uh, glomerular disorders, diabetes, hypertension, particularly in the older population. And interestingly, about 10% of patients with chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney failure are labeled as having CKD of unknown cause. CKD can be uh, silent, and so when, they, when patients often present, at, particularly at end stage, uh, we don't have enough you know, information and our clinical tools are not you know, sufficient to be able to make a diagnosis. And so this is a very frustrating category uh, for clinicians and patients uh, involved. Um, the other thing that's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, important to know about CKD is that there are a lot of comorbidities. Cardiac, cardiovascular morbidities are the most common cause of mortality in this patient population. So let me give you a case study uh, of patients that we, you know, that got us to sort of think about uh, genetic testing. Uh, this is a patient that we saw at Columbia many years ago. I always talk about this case, 57-year-old who was diagnosed with kidney disease. He had blood and protein in the urine. He had had an evaluation by a nephrologist who did a kidney biopsy and diagnosed this disorder called focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. This is a glomerular disorder. Um, you know, caused by dysfunction in glomerular podocytes, which are the visceral epithelial cells lining the filter in the kidney. And the most common cause for this is immunological. And most patients are, uh, you know, advised to take an empiric course of steroids to see if this can reduce the proteinuria. And so he was advised to do so, and he came to us for a second opinion. Uh, and when we wind up reviewing the biopsy, we thought that there may be some features in there that might suggest a secondary cause. This may not be a primary focal segmental sclerosis and nephrotic syndrome. And so we said, well, wait, let's do sequencing and let's see what's going on with you first before we wind up doing steroid therapy. And so the exome sequencing here revealed that the patient had a dominant form of Alport syndrome, which is a defect in the glomerular basement membrane. So Alport syndrome are, is caused by mutations in one of three genes, collagen 4A3, A4, or A5. Uh, these collagens are really important for determining the composition of the glomerular and the integrity of the glomerular basement membrane. And essentially, these patients, when they have these defects in the glomerular basement membrane, have leakage, breakage, they, they, um, they leak protein and blood. The patients typically present with blood in the urine. Uh, these collagen genes are ex also expressed in the inner ear. And so the patients develop sensory neural deafness. And there are classic findings on kidney biopsy because uh, there's this essentially uh, a, a, a destruction and thinning of the glomerular basement membrane uh, and that are, that's usually picked up. Uh, and that this is the classic presentation. Of course, this is also expressed in the, uh, in the eye and the patients can also have some uh, abnormalities in the lens called anterior lanticlonus. So this patient really didn't have these classic presentations, okay? Uh, and we looked at the biopsy, didn't have the, it wasn't picked up, but he had, the pathogenic mutation really suggests a uh, diagnostic of Alport syndrome. So this told us that some of these cases that present uh, the clinical manifestations are not typical of the what's described in the textbooks. Um, the other thing is that this is a structural defect of the glomerular basement membrane, and so no amount of uh, immunosuppression is going to help this patient. And so we told them that you need to avoid steroid. At steroids and immunosuppression, we referred them for a clinical trial with conservative therapy, and we started screening at-risk family members because this is a dominant disease. 50% of first-degree relatives would be at risk, and potentially each one of these relatives would be candidates for donating a kidney to this patient when uh, he develops kidney-stage kidney disease. So it has a lot of relevance, not just for the diagnosis of this patient, but also in terms of thinking about disease management and also for family members. So again, when you think about the questions that the patients ask us uh, when they come to first see us, you could see how we can provide a lot of information this way that's useful in answering those four questions for the patient. So once we, we started doing pilot studies that showed that we can really get a, a good diagnostic leaving patients with CKD, and a few years ago, we decided that we're going to do this uh, on a larger scale uh, and wind up doing a study of 3,300 cases with chronic kidney disease who were uh, recruited, uh, a third of them were recruited at Columbia University and were in our biobanking study. Uh, another thousand of them came from this uh, clinical uh, study, clinical trial of, uh, from AstraZeneca called Aurora. This was a study looking at the efficacy of statins in patients with end-stage kidney failure, and they had uh, DNA available. And so we wind up doing exome sequencing uh, and wind up doing variant annotation based on the American College of Medical Genetics uh, uh, diagnostic sequence interpretation guidelines, which are sort of strict guidelines for interpretation of genomic data. They are designed to have a low false positive rate. Uh, 
And so the cohort description is here, which you could see it's mostly 90% adults. It's a multi-ethnic population reflective of the diversity in the United States. And we made sure that we included patients who had all types of clinical diagnoses, congenital disease and cystic kidney disease, glomerulopathies, diabetic nephropathy, hypertensive nephropathy. And then in about 9% of the cases had nephropathy of unknown cause. Again, this category of disease that's very frustrating. And a third of the patients had a family history of chronic kidney disease, which is typical when you talk to your patients with chronic kidney disease, a third of them will tell you they have a family history. And this is the bottom line. Overall, the diagnostic yield was 9.3% in these patients. So roughly one in 10 patients had a monogenic form of kidney disease. And so these monogenic diseases were not distributed evenly across sort of, you know, one or two cases. You know, there, there, there are at least seven or six, seven or 800 monogenic forms of kidney or urologic diseases. But what did we find out was that there were about 66 genes that uh, were implicated in this particular study, but the top three or four were the ones that are found over and over again in all the subsequent studies that have been done. And so the, uh, the top two were mutations in PKD1 and PKD2, diagnostic of polycystic kidney disease, the dominant forms of disease. And then interestingly, another you know, third, over a third of patients had mutations in these type four collagen genes, diagnostic of what's that's typically associated with outport syndrome. Uh, and then we had you know, a 3% associated with uh, uromodulin, uh, which causes autosomal dominant, uh, uh, autosomal dominant tuberous interstitial disease. And then the rest of the patients had mutations in one gene that was, you know, these were all NF1s. And so another way to look at the data is that we had a lot of patients who had mutations in these top four or five genes, and then this long tail of rare diseases that we had identified just by genetics. And so most of the patients who had a monogenic, you know, form of disease such as polycystic kidney disease were clinically, you know, diagnosed. But the rest of the patients, actually, most of them were not diagnosed based on the clinical evaluation. They had this rare disease. Most clinicians are not attuned to these uh, diseases or to their clinical presentation. And so we made new diagnoses for these patients. So similar to the one that uh, I, I mentioned to you. So what was also really gratifying is that we had a diagnostic rate of about 17% in patients who had kidney disease of unknown cause. So... Uh, so we were really gratified by this and said, okay, well, this, this sounds really, you know, uh, like a really great tool to be able to make progress and understand what's going on with our patients. And so we even reviewed the literature in other studies that had done exome sequencing that and included patients with CKD of unknown cause. In total, there were 443 such patients in the literature described at the time. Um, and the diagnostic rate was 22%. And you could see in this circle, the outer circle, we, can, we describe all the different genes that were implicated in these 443 patients. Uh, and they map to different clinical disorders, glomerulopathies, tuber interstitial disorders, cystic disease and ciliopathies, et cetera, really telling you that CKD of unknown cause is really a hodgepodge, an like amalgamation of lots of different categories of clinical, disease, uh, clinical uh, kidney disorders. And it's really by doing a comprehensive sequencing, looking very broadly, that you're going to be able to make a diagnosis here. Um, and importantly, again, those type 4 collagen mutations accounted for about a third of these cases. But there were 47 genetic diagnoses that were made. 29 of them represented singleton diagnoses. So again, these really rare diseases, but in the aggregate, there are actually a significant number of them in clinical practice. So the question is, all right, you're going to make a diagnosis. I, I gave you an example where there's a change in management. How frequently do you see this change in management? And we collaborated uh, with Natera, which is a diagnostic sequencing company, to do a national study uh, where we had uh, 31 different uh, um, sites which wind up doing enrolling patients uh, prospectively in, this, in the sequencing, in the panel, uh, to see what happens. So the overall the diagnostic rate was 21% in the study because probably we had a, a, you know, sort of a referral bias. Uh, clinicians referred patients you know, that they suspected had a genetic disease, but it was very similar to what I told you about in terms of the diagnostic yield across all the different categories. In addition, we did surveys of the clinicians at the time they ordered the genetic testing and a month after the return the results of the genetic testing, asked them whether there is a change in management. And so what we found is that in the patients that had a positive genetic diagnosis, 30% of the cases, they had a change in management. 
the clinicians reported that they changed therapy, they changed referral patterns, they changed surveillance. There was some form of a change in management that occurred as a result of the genetic information. And so this is a type of information that we need to collect um, across the field to be able to demonstrate the utility of genetic testing and see how management changes to be able to sort of introduce this convince clinicians that this matters, but also, you know, hopefully get re uh, uh, reimbursement from insurance companies. So let me give you another case. Um, this is a 42-year-old man who has chronic kidney disease uh, and uh, proteinuria. A biopsy was not possible uh, because, uh, you know, they, 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 they referred us to us for deferred him to us for evaluation. He was obese since early childhood and had high diabetes and hypertension, but the biopsy was not possible because his BMI was 72. Uh, so basically he was so obese that we were unable to do safely do a kidney biopsy. So we told them that he should really lose weight, uh, try some dietary counseling, uh, and some, you know, to, to see what, what happens. And because he could have hypertension associated kidney disease, he could have diabetes associated kidney disease, or he could have obesity induced FSGS. And we weren't quite sure. Uh, and so we said, okay, you should lose weight. And he said, well, thank you very much for this insightful comment uh, and recommendation, doctor. Um, I've been, you know, I've had this problem with my weight all my life and I haven't been able to be also unsuccessful. And I've tried, you know, I'm going to try bariatric surgery. So we told him, okay, uh, this is great, but in the, and you should do this. That will be very helpful. But in the meantime, we're also going to enroll you in our sequencing study. So it turns out this patient had a mutation in his monocortin-4 receptor. Uh, and uh, and this is what's monocortin-4 receptor. It's a receptor in your brain that transduces leptin signaling. Leptin is produced in response to, to eating and signals satiety. And these patients essentially do not sense satiety. Uh, and they're prone to binge eating, which we, in retrospect, when we talked to him, he had he had this problem. And this is an example of a patient who has a mutation in his MC4R receptor and his sibling who doesn't have that mutation. So what's important about this particular study was that uh, uh, the 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 you know, the, the patient actually was contemplating a, a, a laparoscopic sieve gastrectomy, and um, the. It's been shown in the literature that these sleeve gastrectomies actually are not effective in these patients. In fact, you need to do these bypass procedures to be able to do this, uh, to be able to really be effective. But most importantly nowadays, well, we have the magic drugs. We have the GLP-1 agonists, which have been shown to be very effective for this particular disorder, as well as now there are clinical trials targeting to medical medical for receptor, which are also very, uh, very effective. So here he is a, he's somebody who hadn't been, you know, because of a language barrier, uh, wasn't able to get proper care for a long time. Finally, he wound up getting care. And then, you know, through sequencing, we wind up finding a way to really treat him and particularly targeted treatment that might be available through him. And we enrolled him in a clinical trial. In addition, he had family members who had milder phenotypes, actually, but exhibited sort of the same phenot uh, same behavior. So, again, family members who could, you know, now be uh, worked up and uh, and diagnosed. So this was, this was really uh, uh, gratifying for us. And so this was somebody who had a... Clinical syndrome is an endocrine syndrome, uh, but was really relevant in terms of its uh, the, the, clinic, uh, the clinical implication for kidney care because now we could hopefully help with the obesity and hopefully help with the hypertension, diabetes, and also kidney disease. Uh, this is another example of a patient who's a 15-year-old uh, with elevated uh, liver function tests. Um, he had normal albumin, uh, normal INR and bilirubin. The serum uh, seroplasmin level was initially, uh, at, was initially normal at 26. So he had all kinds of screening, and then finally also a, a, a liver biopsy, which showed some perisinusoidal uh, fibrosis, uh, which you can see here, uh, and then some steatosis with some, uh, as you can see here, with some glycogen nuclei. So he was tentatively given a diagnosis of fatty liver disease. Um, however, he was enrolled in one of the other sequencing studies that we were doing for liver diseases at our institution. And it turns out that once the sequencing was done, he had a very well-known pathogenic mutation in ATPB7, which was diagnostic of Wilson disease. And when we repeated the serum for seroplasmin level, the, the, num, the, 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 the level was low and diagnostic of basically um, Wilson disease. So this was something that was essentially missed. The appropriate workup was done. Nonetheless, because some variation in blood levels of seroplasmin, uh, this was not, was not detected. And so 
Wilson disease is a disease of copper metabolism. It causes liver disease, uh, but also the, uh, the copper deposition uh, winds up causing all kinds of problems, including uh, you know, neuropsychiatric disease over time. And chelation therapy is important because that can actually help uh, with uh, reducing the deposition of copper uh, abnormalities in all the different, uh, 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 in the different organs. And so uh, there's actually a regression of fibrosis as possible. So again, this is another patient who really benefited from this type of sequencing. So there's lots of these patients. And even when you think about the genetic diagnosis, some of the clinical tests may not be sufficiently, uh, um, may not have enough re resolution to be able to give us a diagnosis. So the genetic testing helps again in these situations. So um, lots of different scenarios I can tell you about, but you know, this is, if there's anything you're gonna take away from this uh, talk, uh, this is the slide to, to really focus on. Uh, this is really thinking about the clinical predictive of a positive diagnostic lead. When should you think about a genetic disease? What are the red flags? So the, the clinical phenotype obviously is important. If somebody comes in with cystic kidney disease, then you, know, you gotta think about a genetic polycystic kidney disease. If they come in with really high cholesterol levels that are off the charts, then you gotta think about familiar hypercholesterolemia. So your phenotype is very important. A younger age of onset is important. So when you talk to your patients, you have to talk to them, ask them, when was this, you know, they may see you when they're 40, but some of the symptoms they may have had since they were 16 or 17. And so the age of onset is really important. Ask about a family history of disease. I think that's really important as well. Uh, again, there's a higher diagnostic yield in patients who have a family history of disease. If there are multiple organs that are affected, again, that increases the likelihood that this is a genetic disease. Uh, so ask about, so, you know, get a complete history. Don't just focus on your specialty of interest. There are some populations in, uh, where consanguinity is very high. Uh, and so in those populations, then you got to think about, you know, recessive diseases. And there's sometimes, and there are founder mutations in some populations. And again, you got to be attuned to those things uh, to be able to, to think about genetic diseases and genetic testing. So we've done, as I said, we've done a lot of these sequencing initiatives at our institutions for kidney diseases, for heart, and for liver. For each one of them, we've had a diagnostic yield that's been somewhere between 5 to 10 percent in, in a sort of an unselected population, whether you're looking at kidney disease, cardiomyopathy, and liver disease. And I think this story is going to hold across the board uh, for many, uh, any, any sort of disease category that you're going to think about. So these genetic diseases are common. Uh, they are frequently undiagnosed, and most most often, the clinical presentation that you will see um, in clinic is not the ta textbook presentation. In other words, the patients haven't read the textbook. They don't come in with all the classic presentations that are described in the textbook. So you have to have a high index of suspicion and think about those telltale signs I was uh, telling you about. I think that's uh, that that I think is really important. And then also think about you know the diagnostic results that I'm I'm I, I'm showing here uh, starts to answer the first question that the patients have is you know why you know what is this disease and why do I have this disease? You can tell patients this is the disease that you have uh, and this is due to mutations in this gene. And so you can start to really you know make progress now. And then based on this, you can start to answer some of the other questions, which is what will happen to me and what are the treatment options that are available and so where does genetic help how does genetic help to genetics help you answer some of the other questions so it's very clear that for a subset of genetic diseases there's targeted therapy available and so if you identify those then you can really you know refine your therapy to something that's going to be highly effective and so there's a growing list of those i mean the most common one is familial hypercholesterolemia where again you're you're just Average dose of statin is not going to make a dent in the patient's cholesterol. So you need to use higher dose statins. There are PCSK9 PCSK uh, inhibitors that are available and novel, more novel therapies that are increasingly available to really get the, the cholesterol under control. Amyloid doses, now there is RNAi therapy available. BRCA1 and BRCA2 associated cancers heart inhibitors have been shown to be highly effective in these categories. Fabry disease, there's enzyme replacement therapy, and I can, I can go through this list, um, and there's, there's, like, there's a growing list. And increasingly, I think what's, what's important with the sequencing is that as you sequence more patients, uh, we realize that these rare genetic disorders are not as rare as, as initially described. Now we're starting to add, identify them based on sequence data, not based on clinical phenotype. And so what this tells you and what this tells biotech and pharma companies is that there may be a patient population that can be enrolled into clinical trials. 
And so it may be feasible and tractable to develop therapies. So these may be good disorders to go after. These rare disorders then shouldn't be ignored. Um, and there's an opportunity to provide a treatment and also, you know, uh, and do the, the right clinical trials. Um, so, you know, the other thing that, uh, that's, that's, that's good to know about is that uh, in terms of genetic data, you can also use pharmacogenomic information, right? A lot of the drugs that we're using, even uh, if they're not targeted to specific diseases, um, are subject to variation, pharmacogenomic variation. And so there's now emerging data, and this is an example of a randomized clinical trial that was uh, published earlier in The Lancet, where they used a 12-gene pharmacogenomic panel uh, in patients in, in the healthcare system uh, in, in the Netherlands. And they said, okay, we're going to test people uh, for, these, for this panel. And if they are placed on any of these drugs that are associated with, you know, sort of pharmacogenomic variation, then we're going to ad adjust the dosages based on specific guidelines. And you can see here the list of genes that are on the left and the, the, the drugs that are being used. And some of them are common, phenytoin, uh, atrovastatin, tacrolimus, et cetera, et cetera. And so then they wind up doing the follow-up to see how frequently do you see side effects. And there was a 30% decline in the number of side effects that you see in the patients that had the intervention, that got the data, and the doses were adjusted based on the pharmacogenomic information. So this is another piece of information that genetic data can provide. And you could see how this could be incorporated into health systems. So even if the patient doesn't, is not exposed to the drug, maybe in the future they will be, and there may be alert in the health system, alerts in the health system that can, uh, that can tell you how to tailor the dosage of the therapy. Um, and then uh, going back to the previous point that I was making in terms of new drugs and developing new clinical trials, uh, it's been shown that uh, essentially when people have looked back at the drugs that have been approved through sort of this pipeline of drug development, the drugs that were targeting pathways that had support from genetic studies uh, were much more likely to make it successfully through the pipeline. And so whenever you have these genetic disorders, then you, know, you find new gene, tar uh, uh, these, you, know, you identify genetic basis of disease, you find potentially new targets, and those are much more viable as uh, therapeutic targets uh, based on the evidence that we have in the state. And there are two different studies now that have been published uh, demonstrating that, that this is actually the case. So um, genetic testing can help you, again, identify the patients who may be at risk and then motivate uh, the development of new drugs. So... How about incidental findings? We sequence patients because there's a, they, have, they could have a clinical problem, they have heart disease, kidney disease, et cetera, and then we order a test. But if you do an exome sequence or a genome sequence, there's a lot of information in the genome that may also be relevant to their care. So an example of this is a 63-year-old with a really rare disease called fibrillary nephropathy. Um, nobody really knows what causes fibrillary nephropathy. We wind up doing sequencing, and of course the sequencing doesn't, didn't reveal any known kidney diseases. However, the patient had a BRCA mutation. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, we, this is because we not only looked at this uh, genetic uh, as genes that are causing kidney disease, but also a set of genes that may be causing some early onset disorders that are not necessarily kidney. Uh, and so by the time we went back to the patient, the mammogram had revealed a breast nodule and the patient had actually been diagnosed with having breast cancer. And so she was contemplating therapy, but we informed uh, her, uh, her and her oncologist that she has a BRCA mutation. And so the approach to uh, familiar uh, BRC, uh, you know, uh, early onset breast cancer due to BRCA and BRCA2 mutations are very different than your average you know, breast cancer uh, because these diseases can recur in the, uh, uh, in the other breasts or in the same breast. There's a predisposition to, uh, to ovarian cancer. In men, uh, it's shown that this is also a risk factor for more aggressive and uh, progressive pro prostate cancer. So um, in this case, the patient actually elected for a bilateral mastectomy instead of just getting, uh, you know, your standard, uh, you know, uh, local therapy. And if this becomes a, uh, a metastatic disease, as I mentioned, PARP inhibitors have been shown to be uh, much more effective and targeted for this type of therapy. So, and you do cascade testing to identify other patients, uh, other family members who may be affected. So you can do, you can decide what to do. So that's, that was, so that was really important to the patient's health. We didn't help her with the kidney disease, but really did help her with, uh, in terms of management for, you know, for uh, risk of breast cancer and, uh, and the treatment. In addition, when we realized that she has this uh, BRCA mutation, we looked at the list of medications for fibrillary nephropathy, typically patients on immunosuppression. 
So think about some of the side effects and the long-term side effects of immunosuppression. One of, one, of, uh, one of those is actually the development of cancer. So here you have a patient who's on immunosuppression for their kidney disease, yet they have a genetic predisposition to cancer. They already had a cancer. So you really have to think about how to modulate a kidney therapy for this patient, given her risk factor for cancer. And in fact, so this is something that we're going to have to think about in all of our patients who are getting a solid organ transplantation who are on immunosuppressive therapy for their uh, rheumatological or immunological disorders, because a subset of them will have genetic predisposition to cancer. And so this is an opportunity for us to really tailor our immunosuppressive therapy so that we don't wind up with long-term complications such as cancer in these patients, or at least we don't make it worse with those patients. So there's a list that the American College of Medical Genetics has put together. These are called the list of actionable genes um, that are present in you know, one to 2% of the population. Uh, these are mostly predisposition to cancer, but also cardiovascular diseases, um, cardiovascular diseases, inborn errors of metabolism, and so forth. So BRCA1, our sudden cardiac death, for example. And if you identify mutations in these genes, there's something you can do to prevent the, the associated morbidity and mortality. And so... So it's important to, to actually discuss this with the patients. And in most of these exome and large panels, there's an option to actually return such results to patients. And so that's part of the discussion. And I think increasingly these are also, you know, as we're looking at, uh, they may have wider implications for clinical care as exemplified by our patient who had who was on immunosuppression and had the BRCA mutation. So how about prognosis? This is something that the patients ask about. What is the long term? What will happen to me, right? And so this is like new data that has just emerged from Iceland, looking at the patients who had these actionable mutations uh, in their genome. Iceland has a unified healthcare system and they've sequenced a large number of their population and they can do follow-up. And what they show essentially is that there's a high, there's a reduced lifespan in patients who are carriers in these, for these mutations. And so in terms of prognosis and thinking about when you're going to act sooner in these, for these patients, I think this is the type of information that's needed to be able to risk stratify these, uh, our, our, this, this patient population, identify them early, uh, do the appropriate uh, you know, uh, intervention earlier on to, provide, uh, to prevent mortality. I think, I think this is our hardest endpoint possible, right? So we similarly have looked at the prognosis of patients who have genetic diseases in, among patients who have chronic kidney disease. And this is a study that was done by Mark Elliott. We looked at nearly 6,000 individuals who have chronic kidney disease, which had, who had genome or exome sequencing, did the diagnostic analysis, and around 6% of them had a monogenic form of kidney disease. And what we see essentially is that uh, patients who have a monogenic form of kidney disease are much more likely to develop end-stage kidney failure on an average time of you know, uh, 10 years of follow-up. And this was consistent across all three cohorts. And you can see the risk of progression in terms of the GFR decline is much higher. And when we meta-analyzed, essentially the odds ratios for kidney disease, kidney failure was about twofold. So these monogenic dis disorders are under-recognized. They don't present in the classic presentation that's in the textbooks. Um, they're associated with increased morbidity and mortality sometimes. Uh, and so this is really affords an opportunity to intervene early if we recognize it uh, early. So um, let me tell you uh, really quickly about polygenic scores and how all of these things are not deterministic. Um, you know, we have so far, I've told you about these monogenic diseases for which there's a single variant with a large effect. But of course, everything is a uh, spectrum. And so not everybody who has the same, even people who have the same exact same genetic mutation don't have the same clinical course. And so this can be, you know, so we think that probably there is genetic and environmental factors involved to modify this. And so what we do know is that there's a different model that we can look at in terms of genetic predisposition, which is the uh, polygenic uh, uh, you know, disease, essentially inheritance of multiple genetic variants, each of which has a tiny effect on a phenotype, but can result in, 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 you know, in an increased propensity of the disease. And it's the interaction between these rare genetic mutations that have a very large effect and the ones that are you know, uh, more common and have a smaller effect, which determine the, sort of the severity of the phenotype that, uh, um, uh, that we see. 
So an example of this is for polygenic score is for obesity. I think this has been very well studied now and is this, the polygenic score that's been determined uh, for obesity is, is fairly robust. So people have developed these uh, obesity polygenic scores. So, you know, and they've shown that people who have a very high, you know, have inherited a lot of these uh, common variants with a small effect are at the extreme of the population also for weight. And in longitudinal studies that they've shown that, okay, uh, people who are born with these uh, with a high polygenic risk for obesity are much more likely uh, to develop obesity uh, by age 18 or middle age. And there are increased risk for extreme obesity, for getting bariatric surgery, coronary heart disease, heart failure, and even mortality. So... So this is the polygenic risk for disease. Um, the problem with these polygenic risk scores is that they have to be standardized for each population and they're not quite portable and there's a lot of research going on. So they're not quite ready for prime time in the research realm. I think it's really interesting to look at it. And so remember our patient who had uh, a uh, monogenic form of obesity, I mentioned he had family members, but some family members were not as uh, affected as he was. And so the question was, why not? So. Uh, this group uh, published uh, a study looking at polygenic risk for obesity as well as in its interaction with this MC4R mutation. So this is a distribution that determined the polygenic risk for, uh, for BMI in the, in, and divided patients in terms of their um, you know, the polygenic score. Okay, These are patients who had a high genetic risk, polygenic risk, and people who had a low polygenic risk. And you could see that the, sort of they divided this into... Uh, into into quintiles, and in general, you could see that as you move from the first to the to the to the to the fifth quintile, there's a how much higher prevalence of obesity in general, and then they subdivided each of these quintiles based on the presence of uh, a mutation in MC4R. So they had 202 patients who had mutations in MC4R, and you see that the prevalence of obesity is much lower in the patient who has an MC4R mutation but has a low polygenic score. Uh, for uh, for obesity compared to the patient who has an MC4R mutation, but also has a high polygenic score. So the genetic background essentially modifies the risk conferred by these monogenic uh, you know, disorders. And Christoph Kirillok, one of my colleagues at Columbia, has done the same thing for monogenic kidney diseases. He's devised a polygenic score for chronic kidney disease and then looked back at patients who had a mutation, let's say, in polycystic in PKD1 and 2, and showed that patients who had what carry who were carriers and had a high polygenic score were much more likely to develop CKD compared to to the carriers who had a low polygenic score. And so this is a type of resolution we're trying to obtain now to be able to really differentiate and look at variation in outcome uh, for our patients. And so we can better inform patients about prognosis. So um, we also want to return these results to, to our patients. And so when we first got those research results, we said, okay, we are obligated to return them. And so how do we return those research results to our, to our patients in nephrology clinic and Jordan Nestor, who was a fellow at the time and now a faculty member at our, in our division, uh, winds up taking that on as her project. And she uh, identified 20 distinct challenges to be able to implement genetic testing and return of results to patients in our clinic. Some of the challenges were patient education, physician education, access to diagnostic testing in a clinical setting, interpretation, genetic counseling, and then referral network of uh, subspecialty physicians, because every time you identify one of these genetic diseases, they typically affect multiple organs, and so you need a multidisciplinary team to take care of them. So we wind up developing then this workflow, and this led us to have a genetic kidney clinic. Um, the other thing that we thought about was how we're going to return these results in a way that actually our patients understand what's going on. Uh, and so Hila Rasuli, one of our assistant professors, was really interested in this topic, one of developing a literacy score, a genetic literacy test. So essentially, this is a, a five-minute test that you can take, which has, a, you know, it's a word recognition test. You ask patients to recognize uh, 50 different words and tell you whether this is a real word or if this is a, a pseudo word, this is, you know. Uh, and so it turns out that, uh, you know, both, you know, patients and physicians, there's a large number of common terms that we use in genetic medicine. And when, when we talk to our patients that they don't recognize, such as, you know, penetrance of disease. 
Uh, and so, uh, or the term homozygous, they don't understand. So I think we need to do a long way to be able to explain things a lot better to our patients uh, so that they also have better satisfaction. We realize that also patients who have a low genetic literacy are the ones who are most dissatisfied with the outcome of genetic testing because they have unrealistic expectations of what genetic testing can can disturb can provide for them in terms of hopping them with. So, so we try to also develop these tools to do this. Uh, and so we developed a genetics clinic, uh, a kidney genetics clinic uh, that we launched during the pandemic, actually. This is uh, all the video visits that are done. Uh, we have referrals now from uh, uh, over 20 states. And so, and, and it took off very nicely. We have genetic visits that are just, uh, where there's a there's a nephrologist who has genetics expertise, who works with a genetic counselor, or we have genetic counseling only clinics. And, um, and you know, this been, we've had a lot of great referrals uh, and this keeps on going. And we have a, you know, a, a lot of demand now. What's interesting is we realized that some clinicians no longer refer to us. And we said, so what happened? Are you dissatisfied? And they said, no, we actually, I understand what you guys are doing. I've become very comfortable and I'm doing it myself. And so this is where we want to go. We want to be able to, you know, we educate clinicians, make them comfortable with it so that they can take on the most common scenarios uh, by themselves. So, and then two words about predictive testing. What I'm telling you about so far is about diagnostic testing. A person has a disease. Uh, there's a limited set of hypotheses that you're going to explore about their etiology of their disease. You send a genetic test. And then if it's positive, then the genetic test has a very high positive predictive value. Okay. Now, Something, you know, it's something completely different to do predictive testing. In other words, if somebody is otherwise healthy and then not they want to do exome sequencing or genome sequencing because they're worried, because somebody in the family has it, or should they, should they read something on the news in the news. So there you're testing a much wider set of uh, hypotheses. And so your a priori probabilities are much lower that the person has a genetic disease if you find a variant that indicates this. So we, we're, fam we're sort of familiar with this concept in diagnostic testing, right? If there's a low a priori prior probability of a disease, even if you get a positive result, it's much more likely to be a false positive than to be a true positive. So... We looked at this for our patients uh, with looking at the list of genes that cause kidney disease in uh, nearly 8,000 individuals who are self-declared healthy. And we realized that when we really screen the data and if we really look very, very carefully at all the genetic information, filter the genetic data very significantly, still about 1% of this population has a genetic variant that's suggestive of a, uh, uh, a genetic kidney disease. So that number seems still pretty high, but I'm not sure. We weren't able to go back to verify whether they actually had undiagnosed, unrecognized kidney disease. Um, and so, as you can imagine, if you start doing this type of predictive screening, it could lead to a lot of healthcare expenditure because people, uh, clinicians will order more tests to be able imaging studies, diagnostic tests to verify this genetic testing. And so we have to show that it actually ha it has, is cost-effective and, and valuable to be able to do this. So, um, so some of these variants that we identified could be you know, pathogenic and the patient is, uh, is affected but not diagnosed, but maybe, maybe they will develop future risk of the disease or maybe erroneously reported as pathogenic. And so that's the real challenge also that we have is to be able to clean, it, clean up the genetic databases to make sure that what's actually reported in databases and the way we interpret uh, the data is as rigorous as possible to avoid a false positive. Uh, and so, you know, talking about these sort of, and so we really have to think about a list of genes that we think are really actionable that we can interpret really well as the first wave of sort of diagnostic testing that we can deploy in the general population. Otherwise, we're going to wind up with a lot of these issues that have been now reported in the literature where there's a potential for misdiagnosis. You can misclassify these variants uh, and, uh, and tell somebody they have a predisposition, for example, to breast cancer. And this has happened in the literature, and that's resulted in lawsuits. That's advertised here in the... Uh, uh, in the Wall Street Journal, where a family was told that they have a genetic predisposition, they underwent, you know, therapy, mastectomy, etc., and then they were told that now this genetic variant has been reclassified. In fact, it's benign. Okay, in in the cardiovascular field, there are people who have been told they have a genetic predisposition to cardiac arrhythmia. They had implantable, you know, 
uh, defibrillators that were uh, placed, but in fact, to you know, to, and entire families had uh, these defibrillators placed, and this was later found to be completely benign. So there's a potential to do harm, and so we want to make sure that we're very judicious in this uh, in the implementation. So right now, we have a patient comes to see the physician. Uh, there's a workup that's done, and based on the workup, you order genetic testing, and the plan is formulated. Um, in the future, I think what's going to happen is that there's a patient who's going to come with their genome sequence. The, the physician is going to do a genome-directed workup uh, to, uh, to have a plan that's formulated uh, as a result. So in summary, the myogenic diseases are common and frequently undetected. You got to think about the telltale signs that uh, indicate uh, uh, genetic kidney disease, genetic, genetic diseases in general. Um, there are many implications for disease management, family screening, uh, man, uh, and, and so forth, risk stratification. And I think in the future, we're going to be able to do a lot more risk stratification to predict, predict risk of disease and tear therapy. So these are some online resources for you. And then you know, I want to acknowledge all my colleagues and collaborators and our funding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gravari, for a very stimulating grand rounds, taking personalized medicine to nephrology to, to the limit. Thank you very much. Um, we, I'd like to thank the uh, Kidney Foundation of Florida for sponsoring today's lecture. And maybe we have time for just one or two questions. So one of the, how might you respond to the comment that the databases that look at normative uh, genomes are somehow um, uh, not necessarily representative of the entire population in terms yeah. of ethnicity, racial makeup, yeah. and so forth. And so how does one uh, correct for that? Yeah, I think this is a really important uh, problem that's uh, recognized in the field of genetics. The vast majority of genetic uh, sequencing has been done in populations of European ancestry. And so this has led to misclassification of these variants uh, quite often. And so um, what, popular, what we're trying to do in the genetics community is to include uh, more diverse populations in these sequencing studies so we can have a much you know, more diverse uh, database and we don't misdiagnose patients. But it's still, as every study that you wind up doing uh, has a higher prevalence of uh, European populations. So I'm involved in the All of Us study, which is uh, geared towards you know, increasing diversity. And so what we've done in New York, for example, we recruited 30,000 individuals to date, and 90% of them can be, uh, can be classified as underrepresented in biomedical research in one way or the other. And so I think we're all trying to do this, it's, you know, and we need to gain the trust of uh, different communities to increase participation in research. Right, and involving the community themselves with the collection as the All of Us is, has, has done. Well, I want to thank you very, very much for your presentation today, taking time to come to visit us in Miami. It's a real honor to have you here. Thank sure. you so very much.